Once long ago, in the land of the Roman Empire, there was an emperor named Caesar Augustus who believed he should have anything he wanted. Of course, having anything he wanted cost a lot of money, and he was always looking for different ways to fill his money rooms. One day, he was fretting over the problem of members of the emperor's council, and one of them, a high-ranking senator, said to Caesar Augustus, That's an easy problem to solve. Tax the people. Hmm, mused Caesar Augustus. Do we not already tax them? Of course, answered the senator, but there are always reasons for a new tax, reasons we haven't considered before. And what could that be? asked the emperor. Give it some thought, some serious thought. A murmur of agreement rippled among the members of the emperor's council. They began to pace the floor of the palace, nodding their heads in deliberation, mumbling to themselves. And then one of them, no one remembers his name, blurted out, I have the answer. Tax them for being born. Order them to gather in the place of their birth, then take account of them and assess the tax based on numbers. Excellent, declared Caesar Augustus in his booming emperor's voice. Everyone will pay. That way, it will be fair to all. Indeed, agreed the members of his emperor's council. Send out a decree with my soldiers, ordered Caesar Augustus. Tell all they must bring the money for their taxes to the city of their birth. Those who disobey me will be punished. And so the soldiers went into the countryside, over all the land of the Roman Empire, making known the wishes of the emperor. And the people quaked in fear knowing how ruthless the soldiers of the emperor's army could be. Now in the region known as Bethlehem, there was a poor farmer whose name was John. He and his wife Elizabeth had no money, only a few animals that he kept in his barnyard. What are we to do? asked Elizabeth. How can we give money to the emperor when we have no money for ourselves? We must sell our animals, her husband said woefully. His wife wept in sadness, for the animals were special to her and to her husband, like old and cherished friends. What Elizabeth did not know was how truly special the animals were, for the animals could understand and speak human language, and they had overheard the desperate conversation between John and Elizabeth. If we are sold, we will not see one another again, said their leader a majestic ox named Otto. It will be the same as being a slave, and I will not be a slave. I will never, never bow down before mankind. We must escape and stay together. Otto's friends were afraid. Surely we would be found, said the twin sheep, Seba and Sarah, both speaking the same words at the same time. The other animals agreed, the rooster called cock doodle the goat with the odd name of Goose, and the goose that was called Goat, the jumbled-up names given to them by the donkey named Doc, who was always playing tricks on his friends. If we were caught, and I'm certain we would be, we could be sold to anyone, said Goat the Goose. If we stay together, perhaps we would be sold together to the same person. We are a family. Families should be together. Stay if you wish, argued Otto. Tonight, when it is dark, I leave. And so, that night when darkness covered the dome of the sky, and stars blinked in the heavens like fireflies, Otto put his great chest against the fence of the barnyard and pushed mightily. The fence fell, and his friends watched as he strolled away defiantly, stopping only to snort at a night bird that flew from an olive tree to sweep over his horns. Be careful, cock a doodle called softly. There are soldiers everywhere, mean soldiers. What do I care, replied Otto as he shook his head at the night bird. Where is there a soldier so strong as I am? He snorted again and disappeared into the dark velvet of the night. I fear for him, whispered Goat the Goose. 
He only pretends to be brave. We all know he's afraid of his own shadow. Yes, said Goose the Goat. Yes, echoed Doc the Donkey. So true, agreed Cockadoodle the Rooster. Yes, yes, said Seba and Sarah, speaking in unison. The fear that Goat and Goose and Doc and Cockadoodle and Seba and Sarah had for their friend Otto was sadly real. Otto soon became homesick. It was lonely hiding day after day among thickets of trees and shrubs, and he was constantly in danger. Dogs belonging to shepherds barked at him and chased him. Wolves snarled at him. Once he was certain that he saw a bear. From his hiding he watched groups of travelers going into the cities to be counted by census-takers and to pay the empress tax, and he could see bands of soldiers marching across the countryside, their spear tips sparkling in the light of the sun. Most of all, he missed his friends. He was cold and tired and hungry. Then one evening, as the wind howled throughout the hills, Otto whispered to himself, I am not as brave as I thought I was. He turned toward Bethlehem, toward his home. The following morning, as he approached Bethlehem, he heard a voice calling his name excitedly, Otto! Otto! It was Goose the goat, who was standing on the top of a small building. He jumped from the building and raced to Otto. We knew you would return, said Goose. Every day I've watched for you from the top of the building. You could have been captured, Otto exclaimed. Goose laughed in the way a goat laughs, a sort of behind sound. No one thinks anything about a goat climbing on buildings, he said. It's what goats do. Where are the others? asked Otto. Come, I'll show you, answered Goose. As they walked, Goose explained they had been sold to a man who owned an inn, a relative of Farmer John. He has a wonderful stable, said Goose. It's large and dry and warm. We live there with a few mice, but they're friendly enough. And there's plenty of room and a lot of summer hay. You can even have your own manger to eat from. Of course, it will take some time for me to get accustomed to such luxuries, said Otto. I've always liked roughing it. I love the danger of not knowing what's waiting for me over the next hill. Goose smiled at the boasting of his friend knowing that Otto would tremble in fear if one of the mice squealed at him. The reunion at the stable was loud and happy, with made-up stories from Otto of being hunted by soldiers, of mighty and terrifying battles with wolves and bears, of having shepherds throwing rocks at him. It is not easy being alone having so many enemies to watch for, said Otto. It is why I decided to return to make sure all of you were safe. Cockadoodle chuckled softly. We're glad you're back with us, he said. None of us are as brave as you. He looked at Goat the Goose and winked. There's no reason to worry now, boasted Otto, munching straw from a large manger. If I can chase away soldiers and wolves and bears and shepherds, I can surely protect us from a few mice. Besides, what can happen in a stable? That night, Otto would discover the answer to his question. Miracles can happen in a stable. At sundown, the door to the stable opened, and the keeper of the inn stepped inside. With him were a man and a woman who was near childbirth. A look of quiet suffering was on her face. I wish I had better accommodation, said the innkeeper, but with so many people coming to be counted for the census, and to pay the emperor's taxes, this is the only place I have. The animals won't bother you, and there's plenty of hay to make beds. Thank you, said the man to the innkeeper. This is much better than sleeping outside in the cold. The innkeeper looked at the woman. Your wife seems very close to childbirth, he said. Yes, the man answered, very close. For the next few hours, Otto and his friends watched as a man and his wife tried to rest. Outside, light from a brilliant star seemed to cover the stable, its beams shining through the windows. The night 
was eerily silent. Then, near midnight, the woman began to deliver the child she carried in her womb. Her deep, labored breathing echoed in the stable. Her husband spoke to her gently. Do not be afraid, Mary. God is with you. God is in you. Yes, she whispered through her pain. Soon the child was born, and Mary lifted him up to the light that streamed through the windows. The light surrounded him, soft as a candle's glow. Look, Joseph, she said to her husband. He is delivered to us. As God has promised, said Joseph. Jesus, he shall be named Jesus, said Mary. As he watched Mary wrap the child in swaddling clothes, Otto was strangely warm by a joy he had never before sensed. He moved from the shadows of the stable and lowered his head and pushed the manger he had been eating from toward Mary. The other animals gathered around him. You were giving us your manger? asked Joseph. Otto made a nod with his head. Then it shall be his cradle, said Joseph, and all of you will be forever blessed for you are first to see the promise made whole. And then Joseph took straw and filled the manger, covering it with a soft blanket of spun wool, and Mary placed the child named Jesus on the blanket. And Otto did something he had vowed never to do. He kneeled before the manger cradle and bowed his head in worship, and one by one each of his friends did the same. In the days that followed, many people came to the stable to see the child, to bow before him as Otto and his friends had done, shepherds and star beckoned kings and kinsmen and the curious who had heard stories of angel song and of voices from the heavens. And so it is today, as it was in that long-ago time of an emperor named Caesar Augustus. The birth of the promise made whole is seen again by shepherds and by kings and by believers throughout the world, and yes, by stable animals kneeling in praise. Amen. Amen.